All right, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Barry Cross, and I'm your host and facilitator here this afternoon. As we provide a bit of a sample um, for people considering our MBA programs, and specifically our accelerated MBA program here at the Smith School of Business at Queen's. So uh, we've got a little less than an hour together, and we'll have some time for some interaction and Q&A a little bit later. Um, but really, as I said, this is what I call a bit of a taste test uh, ahead of time for you, for those people considering Queens. Uh, there's no hard sell associated with this session. This is a bit of uh, fairly current content that I've actually been using in class. I am a professor here at Smith. I'll introduce myself in a second. And this is really just to give you a sense of you know, what some of this experience would be like. Um, in our accelerated MBA program, much of the content is delivered virtually. Uh, we've all become quite used to that over the last little while. Um, you are receiving this at your own locations, whether that's in your home, at work, uh, on an iPad, on a phone somewhere, sitting in a subway. Um, we are delivering this from our studio, and this is where we broadcast this content to individuals and teams right across the country when it comes time for uh, those every other week sessions uh, that are part of that, that one year long program in the Accelerated MBA. All right, so uh, really quickly on myself, um, I'm an operations strategy prof here at Queens. I've been here now for 15 years. Prior to that, I spent almost 20 years out in industry doing the kind of stuff that you've been doing and hopefully you want to do in the future. I spent time in Asia, I spent time in South America and Latin America, a lot of time over in Europe. Uh, leading different organizations like Magna and DuPont and a really cool private company called Auto Systems, uh, doing some, some pretty amazing stuff in these various regions. Before, ultimately, I chose to use my powers for good and join Queens back here in 2006. All right, so that's kind of me. Um, let's jump straight over into the content. All right, and as I said, we're broadcasting live from a studio here down in the basement of Goods Hall. That's our business school here in Kingston. Um, some of you actually may have been part of uh, the Smith experience for your undergrad. Basically, people applying for the accelerated MBA program have an undergraduate degree in business or commerce of some form, which allows a bit of a head start. And that's why we can give you a full MBA experience inside of one year. Now, the content that I've got for you here today is what I call peak economics. And we're going to start by talking a little bit about what peak means. And I've got a couple of examples. Then we're going to apply that to the automotive and manufacturing sectors. And then most importantly, we're going to wrap up talking about what all that means to you and your current organizations inside of that particular space, whatever space that you're in at this time. All right, so what is peak? Peak, you may remember about 15 years ago, we are talking quite a bit about this idea of peak oil. And peak oil at the time was about this concept that we're, as a society, going to run out of oil. They believed at the time that we discovered all of the available oil that was out there that we could mine and extract inside of those available global resources. And the fear was, when we run out, we're going to have energy shortages, the costs are going to go sky high, and it was interesting because as more people bought into this whole concept, you started to see the price of oil going up, $120 a barrel, $130, $140 a barrel. And what we soon realized was that peak oil in that version really wasn't going to happen. New extraction techniques and the fact that our consumption actually started to decline meant that peak oil didn't happen. Oil did not peak and may never peak in that particular fashion. So we'll talk about that a little more later. So that's the idea of peak. It's the idea of maximizing a current business model before it basically ends. And there's something that happens here at the end, which we'll talk about. Now, something that did peak were horses, interestingly enough. Horses, carriages, buggy whips, all that type of stuff. And this happened about 100 years ago. Uh, in fact, at the time, there's something like 25 million horses around just North America, and very quickly they started to decline. Well, what happened? Well, obviously cars. Cars happened. Vehicles happened. And the horse and carriage business model ended and was replaced by this new form of transportation. A couple of very key points here associated with this. A, this transition happened really quickly. 
all things considered, it happened in less than 10 years, this transition from, a call it a horse-driven society to a motor vehicle-driven society. It happened in less than 10 years. The second key point is that this current version of this automotive business model that we've been enjoying here uh, has been around for 100 years, and that's a long time for any business model, which tends to tell you that something is about to happen with that, which is really why we're here today. Right, so this is that concept of peak auto. Now you may remember about two years ago where General Motors and Ford both announced some pretty massive plant closures around North America. Six plants for Ford, eight plants for General Motors, something like that. We're closing these plants, closing that production down for these vehicles. We're not going to make those vehicles anymore. Now the unions at the time got pretty excited about it justifiably in their, in their sense. Uh, they said, you know, this is to reduce costs. Gen GM's going to move all this production down to Mexico. It's about reducing labor costs, labor rates, that sort of thing. And at the time, I'm looking at this and saying, well, what if that's not it? What if this is not about lowering the cost of manufacturing? What if this is really about the idea of not needing as many vehicles in the future as we have in the past? What if we've actually reached peak auto? And that's really the rub of it. For these organizations, we're talking about a massive transition from where they were to what's happening next inside of this particular business cycle. Let me show you three elements that support this argument that I'm making. Element number one, there are fewer young drivers today than there ever have been in recent memory. In fact, the number over the last 20 years has gone down by something like 30%. Now, Guys of my vintage will remember the day you turned 16 years old and you're lining up at the license bureau to get your driver's license, your learner's permit, that sort of thing. And it was almost a rite of passage and everybody when they turned 16 wanted that driver's license permit. Not so much anymore. A lot of factors associated with that. Uh, vehicles themselves are obviously very expensive. There's alternative forms of transportation, which we'll talk about here in a minute. A and a real shift and this is independent of COVID, but a real shift in that there's a lot less going out among that particular demographic now than there were back in the day. All right, so a lot fewer young drivers, 17 to 25 years old, are down by 20 to 30 percent in different markets around the world. All right, so element number one, interesting. Element number two here is this increase in ride sharing and the Ubers and Lyfts and just about everybody that you know has at least one of those apps on their phones. They use them on, the regular, on a regular basis. And, and it's interesting, when you look at Uber's data, here's some of that target demographic that they've got inside of, you know, in, sorry, come back here. And we'll just turn on some color. There we go. Right here. This is interesting. It's not that these people can't afford to drive. When you look at this, they've got bachelor's, advanced degrees, like yourselves, earning six figures or more. They're basically choosing not to. And this is a very significant part of this overall shift. All right, so a couple of things, as I said, happening. Fewer young drivers, more ride sharing going on, but the real tipping point associated with this transition from that old automotive cycle to the next one are these emerging technologies. And really what it is is this autonomous vehicle tech. And people are skeptical in some cases, other people know it's happening. I'll give you the data. Heavy trucks are going to be on the road very shortly with autonomous vehicle capability. And in that long haul trucking and logistics industry, you can see where this makes a lot of sense. Uh, trains are very close. Trains are going to be autonomous here within a couple of years. And the technology is basically available for the cars that you're driving now. And we can expect to see that on the road now in two to four years. So. It's really a combination of these three pieces of, call it research, information that lead us to the conclusion that there will be a drastic change in this whole do-it-yourself automotive cycle where we drive the vehicle, where we own and operate the vehicle, and a lot of repercussions associated with that model and, and what it looks like next. So think about this. Vehicle sales and production inside of North America and Western Europe are already flat at best. They're already flat and in many cases declining. Despite the fact that our population has been increasing in North America over the last 10 years uh, by 25 million. So there's 25, new, 25 million new potential drivers in North America, yet sales and production volumes are actually decreasing through that period of time. This is significant already. It's already happening. So you've heard the saying that nature abhors a vacuum. 
Well, an ops guy like me abhors capacity utilization down and around 10%, all right? This just makes no sense at all in any industry. But really what that is is an illustration of the fact of how we use our vehicles now. And in most cases, our vehicles are sitting in a garage or a parking lot 90% of the time at best. You go out, you drive, you get somewhere, and then you leave your vehicle in a lot. And that's a pretty expensive asset to have sitting around unutilized for that period of time. All right, so let me show you what this could look like as we get a little bit closer. Scenario number one, that single car family. Seven o'clock in the morning, mom drives into work. She's a surgeon at the local hospital. The car then drops her off, turns around, goes back home, picks up kid one and kid two, takes them to high school where they go to their hermetically, hygienically sealed pods inside of their classrooms during COVID for class that afternoon. Car turns around again, picks up dad, gets him down to the bank for his shift. And all of this happens during the day with a single vehicle. The car's running around by itself. 2.30, the car picks up kid two. I named these kids after my own kids, kid one and kid two. And drops kid two at the hockey rink for the practice. Picks up kid one, drops him at their shift for the grocery store. Picks up mom and dad a little bit later. At the end of the day, this car has been working. This car is tired. Right? You think about that, but still, despite all that driving around, this vehicle's capacity utilization is still only 50%, still room for improvement. So maybe in this scenario, dad says to the car, you know, when I was your age, I used to have two jobs already. So we send that car out to Uber for a little while. Right? So ask yourself, the next time you click for an Uber, if that car that pulls up was a self-driving autonomous vehicle, would you get in? Right? Interesting. I've been asking that question now for eight, 10 years. And you, you look at this and 10 years ago, eight years ago, people would say, no, I, I couldn't imagine doing that. But more and more people are very comfortable with that idea of getting in that vehicle, which leads us to scenario number two. Now, companies are actually designing vehicles now for these, call it Uber sharing fractional ownership type platforms. Volvo's one of them, this uh, 360C, for example. Kind of a neat looking car. This is the inside of it. And inside of that vehicle, you can see a few things. Hey, she's got all kinds of space to work, relax, whatever. She's got the Domino's pizza tracker along the side here. You can kind of see that giving her a sense of where she is on her particular journey right now, right? I think that's kind of cool. This is where we are. And, and so what I did was I, I did a, an Uber calculation and I went from Union Station down in Toronto uh, down to Cleveland, and I measured this from the Union Station down to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. I couldn't think of any other reason why you'd want to go to Cleveland. Um, and then you compare the cost of an Uber, call it three to four hundred dollars each way, versus flying. It's about the same cost, interestingly. And the time, if you're at Union Station, you got to get up to Pearson. Maybe you take the up. You got to get through security. You've got all the other things associated with the airport. A um, Couple hours before you take off, a flight of an hour or less, a little less down to Cleveland, and then you've got that shuttle from the airport in Cleveland, downtown Cleveland. So maybe five hours door to door in that scenario. This drive from Union Station in one of these uh, self-driving Ubers or, or whatever the platform is, is gonna take about six hours. So it's an hour longer, but especially in today's world with the whole concern about you know groups and contamination and all that sort of thing there's a lot to be said for this particular model and even without the whole covid thing you look at this and say you know that might be kind of a cool way to do short haul travel toronto to ottawa calgary to edmonton something like that right sign me up i like that idea so a couple of different ways this scenario starts to evolve and really what we're seeing here is, is a shift. And the language that I use here is the idea of a do-it-yourself model in the old traditional where I own it, I operate it, I maintain it, I drive it, I have control automotive business cycle to what we call a do-it-for-me model where the vehicle manages a lot of that process for you. Frees up your time, lower cost, increases capacity utilization, overall cost of ownership for a, fee, for a family going from two or three vehicles down to one or potentially sharing goes way down as well. Um, a lot of practical implications associated with what that industry looks like. And from a business standpoint, this is the statistic here that scares the crap out of me when it comes to what this 
could mean longer term. If I'm part of that industry, and I was for a long time, this is going to lead to production volumes decreasing by something like 30% over the next 10 years. That's a big deal, right? That's a big deal. We're just not going to need as many vehicles. And that's the whole concept then of peak auto, All right? So that's peak auto. Now, for many of you, you're not part of that industry. You're not part of the parts organizations, the dealership models, the automotive manufacturing, anything like that. So you're saying, okay, it's interesting, Barry, but so what? Well, I'm not part of that industry. Well, maybe you are, right? And maybe there's more implication here associated with my particular industry and yours than what may be available at first glance. Think about the insurance industry. Think about the actuaries and the people managing those policies. And when I move from a do-it-yourself model, and most of us are aware that 90% of all accidents that are caused on the road are operator error, right? We're making mistakes as drivers. If I take away those operators, that's gonna change that whole model drastically. Uh, the retail banking, the capital markets associated with lending money to drivers. If the retail lending goes down by 30%, if there's fewer organizations in that business, the whole capital markets and the mergers and acquisitions and all that type of stuff, the lending side of the corporate business, right? Very different. Real estate models and city planners. It's interesting that a major impact on the overall design of society right now is based on us owning and operating our own vehicles, that whole do-it-yourself model. And if that's changed and gone, there are some massive implications for the design of cities, the layouts, the parking lots, the garages, everything else, and where that evolves over the next little while. And even the tax revenue for government inside of this particular situation is going to change. I don't know if they're thinking that far ahead yet. And really what I call peak oil too, where before it was a scarcity in the availability of oil, Oil is peaking now because fewer people are going to need it. Right? That, that's nothing new. The oil price is already down around 35 bucks a barrel, I think, uh, recently compared to you know, previous peaks. It's never going back to previous levels. There's no reason for it. You know, we're moving to alternative forms of energy, right? which I think is a good thing overall. Now, this is what we call a, a business model life cycle. And you've called, seen it as an S-curve, you've called it a product life cycle in the past, but this is, this is basically, a, as I say, a business model life cycle. The automotive model, the automotive industry right now is something like right there on that particular first wave. And, and it's interesting, um, you look at the dynamics of this where if organizations are successful, they can grow and develop and build an industry every one of those industries eventually comes to an end. And this is a natural phenomenon, like gravity. Um, it, it's one of those things that will happen in basically every cycle out there. And this one is now 100 years old and it's coming to an end. The interesting part of this is that there's another one right behind it that's ready to take off. The challenge we've got for many organizations is they will remain skeptical. Uh, leadership will doubt. They will. Uh, point fingers in other directions, saying, oh, we're just going to hunker down, we're going to wait this out, we're going to be fine, right? That's not going to happen to us. The organizations that don't get on this early and start to reshape and adjust and take advantage of some of the opportunities created are going to have a larger innovation gap than other organizations. And what happens there is, you know, over time, some of their best and most capable people, people like you, are going to move on to other organizations. I'm not going to sit here waiting this out while we kind of sit on our hands. In other cases, organizations, once they get down around this phase here somewhere and they say, okay, it's time for us to go, they may no longer have the resources and capital necessary to drive that next curve. This is the challenge. When I wait too long, we may not be able to do it when we actually choose to pursue that next model. So what we're really looking for then is this, what I call the agile firms innovation gap, where you know what? When we start off, it's not going to be quite as good as the previous version of this model, whatever that model was, but we're going to take advantage of this change and this shift and you know, be able to capitalize on it a little more quickly and really drive what's next in society. And that's where many of you are right now, is in a position where you want to be able to take a leadership role in driving what's next. 
And this is huge for us, and this is really a big part of the focus of our program, is giving people the ability to, to drive what's next inside of their industries and their careers and take advantage of some of these other dynamics. This is a massive shift that's going on very much behind the scenes right now that many people aren't even thinking about. But I can promise you that it's real. And it's being overshadowed right now, obviously, with a lot of the, the COVID-19 situation and a lot of other things. But this is a dynamic that will play a major role in, in the evolution of society over the next little while. So some questions that I want you to think about, and you can apply your organization here as we go forward. Think about the other firms in your particular industry right now, and then think about your own organization. And what are you best at? Banking is a good example. There's five maybe six big banks here in, in Canada, as an example. And if you were to strip off the greens and the reds and the blues, the, the corporate colors of these institutions and walk into one of those banks or go to one of their websites, could you as a consumer actually tell those banks apart? Could you tell the telecoms apart? Could you tell the other players in your particular industry apart if you strip the badging and logos and, and that type of stuff? And, and what's important for me here is that we can absolutely tell ourselves apart from the competition. And what I want you to think about is what you and your organization are best at. What's your bestness? What do you do better than anybody out there? And if you can't define that, if leadership in your organization can't define that, that gives you something to pursue right now. Right? What would it take to knock off one of the big firms in your organization, sorry, in your, in your industry? And this actually applies inside of government as well. And you think about the next federal election. You think about what's happening down south of the border. Um, if strategies change for government and they had to reprioritize funding, agencies and associations can be defunded just as quickly as others are funded. And these types of changes happen radically and happen all the time. Who's not going to be around um, in, inside of our industry? Who's not going to be there in 10 years? Which government agencies um, are, are going to be defunded or funded in the next budget? And even think about healthcare, and I spend a lot of time on, on this inside of you know, some of my own content, because healthcare is front and center for us right now. And think about this. Why do you go to a particular hospital when you need to visit an ER? Why do you go to a particular clinic? Why do patients come to our particular clinic? Would they drive 20 kilometers further to get to the next hospital because of the waiting lines at my particular hospital? And I'm where I live, actually. I'm kind of halfway in between a couple of hospitals. One is 20 minutes one way, one's 20 minutes the other way. And this is an easy decision for me, which hospital I would go to in the event of a crisis. Because the ER waits in one are three to four hours on a good day. The ER waits in the other one, probably half an hour. That's an easy decision for me. And you think about how hospitals and clinics make money. It's basically by the number of patients that they treat. So again, it gets down to the whole idea of bestness. And ultimately, why do you choose to live where you do? Is it the quality of life and the way the, you know, the city and the area is managed? Or because that's where the job is? And it really gets down to a common question for all of us, and ultimately about that bestness and what they're best and truly good at. If your organization ceased to exist tomorrow, would anybody notice? And I can promise you that there's a lot of that going on right now. There's a lot of organizations that are struggling for survival and, and not because of some of the things that we're talking about here. This isn't going away. We're going to solve COVID, right? We're going to solve this and we're going to move on. It may never return back to what we pr previously experienced as normal. But, but there's a lot of this type of change going on right now. And for you, for leaders inside of your organization, it's really about saying, okay, how can I take advantage of this? How can I capitalize on some of this change? A lot of the stuff that's going on inside of my organization, my business, my industry, my team, and, and lead us into whatever is next for that particular industry. And I think that's really cool. Um, this isn't about doom and gloom. It's not intended to be. It's to help people realize inside of our classes, our organizations, the, the clients and organizations that I work directly with, even today, it's to help them realize that it's really up to us to shape what's next and to take advantage of some of these opportunities that are here in front of us. All right, so that's kind of the way we work. Now, that was a bit of content that we would typically broadcast on, on one of our, our weekend classes from the studio where I am right now. 
Um, the difference between what you just saw over the last half hour or so and, and what would actually happen is in the tradition or in a typical class it's a little more live so you've got the ability to punch in ask questions raise your hands we can see each other's faces a little more clearly um, you could be in a boardroom depending on your location with you know five six seven other people just like yourselves from different organizations these cross-functional teams that we put together in some of the larger cities across canada vancouver calgary edmonton toronto montreal um, so you could be in a boardroom learning session with them sitting around a table, seeing the prof, um, seeing the lecture slides, managing that dialogue like it's a real, sorry, a, a, a traditional live classroom, but you're all across Canada. Or you could be in a virtual team out in the East Coast where we've got a couple people from Halifax, St. John's, whatever, who are either working from home, working from the office that day, and, and call it a virtual classroom, but still with that interactive capability. Uh, asking questions, a very dynamic dialogue. We can send you into breakout sessions. Uh, we'll give you case studies and that sort of thing like you're used to. But it's an elevated level of dialogue. It's an elevated level of content, talking about some pretty big issues and really how do we drive that with our toolkit that we've got as business leaders to be able to create what's next for our organizations. Um, so we have, actually, we've got quite a bit of time here for some Q&A. A and you know, we don't need to fill the hour. Um, for those of you that are interested and you want to talk further, uh, the contact information that's on here uh, is an 800 number for our uh, application advisors, and they're there to help you answer questions. Um, they're there to give you the information you need, everything from program uh, dynamics, the costs and fees associated with it, when you're in Kingston, when you're back at home, that sort of thing, and they can walk you through it and even help you out with the application process if you'd like to be able to join us. Um, for the next cohort. Uh, timing for this, uh, the next cohort starts uh, in January officially. Uh, we get started a little bit earlier than that with uh, some of the, the pre-stuff to get you comfortable with it. Uh, but this is really what it's about. Right? This is, it's some pretty big stuff here that we're looking at. So, so with that, uh, I've got Ryan in the studio. I've got Glenn Hollis, who's the director of the AMBA program uh, on tap as well. Um, you can key in questions. What, you, what would you like to know about, you know, what I was talking about, the program itself. I've been teaching in that program now since 2008, so I'm as familiar with the dynamics of the program as anybody. Um, if you've got any questions associated with what we've done here this afternoon or the program itself, I'd be happy to answer them. And so let me know. All right, and I made, okay, I see a question just popped up. I'm going to put my glasses on with the near field, far field. Uh, what if the start of the program, okay, what if I started the program and then I'm relocated to another country? How would this affect me? Well, we've actually worked through that. That's a great question. Uh, people who are relocated around Canada can actually just join one of the other teams. Uh, we've done that. They may choose to stay with their team and just connect with them virtually. Uh, we've got other people who've uh, been transferred. You know, maybe you're banking with uh, an international organization. They want to send you over to London for a six-month stay. Um, not unusual. So you've got the ability then, again, to remain connected to that team, or if it's more feasible to join another team, um, you know, we can manage that. Uh, but because we're broadcasting virtually and we've got virtual boardroom technology capability, you can basically be wherever you are to attend our classes. Now, depending where you are, it may be a bit of a time shift for you. Um, for example, on a Saturday when, sorry, a Sunday morning when we're sending out our first lecture slides, um, we start at 9.30 in the morning Eastern time, so our friends in Vancouver are joining class at 6.30 in the morning, but they're wrapping up, you know, obviously three hours earlier than the folks in Ontario. If you're further east of us, then you're going to be starting a little later in the day. So you've got that time frame dynamic, but you can basically join us from wherever you are at the time. Really good question. Um, I had another uh, chat question pop up. How are teams determined inside of our EMBA? Uh, we actually spend quite a bit of time on that, not me specifically, but the, the admin, admissions team. And as they get to know you, and your background and your industry and that sort of thing, they, they work pretty hard. Um, some of these cities, we actually have multiple teams, like at Toronto, we may have three or four teams, or Mississauga, a couple. We generally have three or four out in Calgary. 
Um, so the teams that get put together are based on people's aptitudes, interests, and, and, and a lot of time on the idea of fit. And then the other interesting part of that is for the first um, onboarding process in that first 10 days of the program, we're actually spending quite a bit of time on the team side of things to get you comfortable, and especially in a virtual environment, working with those teams, getting over any kind of technology hurdles or you know, who leads, who seconds, you know, that type of stuff. Um, and working through with a lot of those dynamics, that, that whole team's function is pretty core to what we accomplish. Uh, and really it has to be, right? We're only together for, call it 12 months, to get you an advanced master's level degree from Queens. So we've got to get you rolling at a fairly high pace here, you know, pretty early in the program. Good, good. Other questions? And please don't be shy. Okay. Good. And, and another one that pops up, um, overall workload. And this will go and call it ebbs and flows through the year uh, for you. And it, it feels, you know, like there's a lot to do and we're cramming a, you call it a master's degree into 12 months, as I said. Uh, the first week is going to fly by. The first, call it three months, are going to fly by. Uh, the time itself uh, goes very quickly for people inside of the program. Um, obviously, there's some sacrifices uh, through that program. Um, most of you are working. Uh, most of you are, are working in, in some pretty high impact jobs, so it's not typical, you know, 35 or 40 hours a week. It's 40, 50, and, you know, if you're in accounting, you know, in the spring tax season, you've got 50, 60, 70 hours a week you're already working. You've got some family life, and then you've got your education, which can be you know, 10, 15, 20 hours a week of work and activity as well. Um, there's some sacrifices. So what typically people tell us is that their social lives get put on hold uh, through that period of time. And, you know, as I said, it goes quickly. And, and before you know it, you're, you're back uh, with that same group of people a little later on. So uh, it's very manageable. And we, we get, a, you know, 115 students coming out of this program every year. Uh, tired, but thrilled. You know, through that process. Uh, what's the average GMAT score required for the program? Um, it's interesting. It's gone up from my day. Uh, back in the day, I think I wrote, when I wrote a GMAT back in 1990, something like that, it was 620 or 650 or something like that. Uh, Glenn, I don't know if you can punch in and, and let us know what the average GMAT is these days and, and really just how much weight you put on that side of things. Might be a good question if you don't mind coming off mute for a second. No, oh, can you hear me okay, Barry? We can, that's perfect. Um, the, the beauty of Barry is he teaches in uh, several of the MBA programs, the Executive MBA, MBA of the Americas, full-time MBA, and the AMBA. Um, we don't require for the AMBA a GMAT. And uh, again, the other programs do, um, which again, why Barry uh, you know, sort of put the thought out there, we may have one, we don't. And the reason that we don't have a GMAT is simply because we recognize and understand you've got an undergraduate in business, you're working in business, and both of those would easily trump any kind of GMAT. And uh, we welcome those that have uh, high, uh, obviously, uh, progress and, uh, and success in both their uh, work experience as well as in their undergraduate. So hope that helps. That's perfect. Good. Thank you, Glenn. And I, I, I probably knew that but had forgotten it at some point. Uh, but yeah, with, with your backgrounds, obviously, it's, it's a very appropriate comment on Glenn's point that, that we don't actually need a GMAT. So if that simplifies things for you, that's great. Uh, another pop-up question that I've got here is on uh, the live versus, call it virtual sessions. Um, we'll, we'll spend the first 10 days together-ish uh, early January, um, where you're here I ideally live in Kingston, uh, in residence with, uh, you know, 100 other people in the program and in your teams but still together and live for the first phase of that program and we go through actually a couple of full courses and then introduce a few of the other courses you're going to do virtually over the next several months you're uh, typically back for another week in the spring and another week in the late fall uh, and that's live so call it three weeks here live in Kingston uh, and the other is the other classes are all basically uh, uh, Two classes Sunday, one class Monday morning. Uh, all classes are, call it, three and a half hours uh, over those weekends. And those weekends are every other weekend. So you've got, call it, two of those sessions per month. Um, 
so every other weekend you're with us on a Sunday and then a Monday morning. So you're really only taking, call it half a day off work every other week as far as it goes. And like I said, that time is going to fly by. Uh, while you're in Kingston, uh, it's not just the educational component. We've got some other, call it uh, quality of life type stuff. We've got uh, a fit to lead group that helps people understand personal nutrition and fitness. And, you know, we'll do everything from inviting people out for a, a run at 630 in the morning, should you choose. Uh, gyms, other types of fitness and nutrition. It's part of the overall experience. Uh, we, we've got a coaching process that helps people uh, from a mentoring and a coaching process, and that's really part of the overall Smith Edge that, that defines some of the advantages of the program. And you know, I, I'm telling you stuff, uh, but it, it's really up to you to, to decide, you know, as far as what you're looking for as part of that overall program. So. All right. I, I don't see any other questions uh, popping up on the screen. And, and I, as I said, I'm not trying to, to do the hard sell or anything like that. It was really about providing some content and some experience for you on what it looks like inside of this, this virtual classroom when we're uh, bringing people uh, together from across Canada uh, for one of our, our weekend sessions. Uh, so with that, um, you can get me as well. Uh, if you've got any questions, we can connect on LinkedIn, ask questions, whatever you like that way. Uh, but I will refer you to these guys if you've got any other specific questions directly about the program. Uh, most importantly, uh, everybody is incredibly busy these days and we're all call it meeting and Zoom to death. It feels like everybody's inviting you to Zoom stuff now as opposed to previously, we might, we might just chat for a couple of minutes. So most importantly, I appreciate you uh, joining us here this afternoon. And uh, we hope to see you come January. All right. Otherwise, be well. And thank you very much for joining us.